And now, another JT Horror After Dark podcast. Alright guys, welcome to another Horror After Dark podcast in the sack with JT. You know the drill, you get in the sack with me, we fuck, we talk about movies. (laughs) And that's exactly what we're gonna do here. Cannibal Holocaust, such an amazing score. Like, absolutely beautiful composition for that movie. (laughs) As disturbing as it is. Now, this is going to be different because it is around 2 a.m. And I just woke up (laughs) after falling asleep mad early. And I got nothing to do tomorrow. So I am binging American Horror Story, my favorite season, Asylum. Now, my whole history with American Horror Story, I watched this show when it first aired, Murder House. Enjoyed it. Wasn't big, big on it. Once this season came out, it blew me away. Because this season is just horror television perfection for me. Like, there are some flaws, of course. The whole alien subplot it's not even a subplot it's like a sub 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 subplot thrown in here is very out of left field and it feels very forced and just like to throw something else into this story that didn't have to be here but besides that most of everything else in this season works the best for me from anything else i don't think this show has ever hit the highs that this season hit since this season I mean, Coven is good. I don't think it's brilliant. Freak Show went down a little after that. Hotel is very good. Roanoke, I actually enjoy. What's the one after that? Apocalypse or something like that. After that, it it really starts going downhill for me. With the cult and with all that woke shit. And this is why I'm doing this as a podcast. Because I can just say shit and claim it wasn't me. (laughs) There's no evidence. There's no... fucking visual evidence i can say it's a voice modulator of something that is scream so if things get too uh too heated <laughs> talking about this show later on then i have a backup plan but asylum is just perfect for me the perfect season of this show and just jessica lang is as always phenomenal but she absolutely kills it in this season as sister jude and Everyone, Lily Rabe, destroys it as uh, Sister Ariunas, and that's her name, right? Something like that. And it's been a while since I've seen this season, so this is going to be interesting. And I'm probably going to just keep going like through each episode. So this is going to be long. Like it's going to be like hours long. <laughs> I'm be, I'm either going to just chop it up into into episodes. Or just release this as a long discussion of the whole season. So, and I'm testing this because I've been trying to think of a way to discuss Twin Peaks for a long time, for a year since I started. Before I started the channel, (laughs) I've wanted to talk about Twin Peaks, and I've just been trying to think of the best way to do it: go through it episode by episode and do little discussion videos per episode or just go by season or just like it's it's been bugging me so let's see how this shit works out and (laughs) i already got like into the second episode before i decided to do this so obviously for those hopefully you've seen it (laughs) she ain't gonna want to hear this shit if you haven't seen it we have uh and sarah paulson also is just a gem like ever since she, I saw her acting in the first uh, season of this, loved her. And same with Evan Peters. Evan Peters is phenomenal. Probably the best actor on this show. I mean, in the like little main cast. I'm not talking about like Kathy Bates and like you know like the other people who've come in on the show. But damn, he's good, man. He always reminded me of a young Johnny Depp. And after seeing him in. Like, I think I'm halfway through the Jeffrey Dahmer show with him playing Dahmer. He's, he kills it. 
and I, I did not expect anything less. Evan Peters is absolutely phenomenal as an actor, and I love everything that he does. So we have whatever her name is. <laughs> yeah, this is going to go well. The um, Sarah Paulson, and she's a lesbian back in the, it's like, what, the 50s or something like that, and 60s, whatever, and... She ends up going, she's a journalist, tries to go into the asylum here and try to see the inside of an asylum and try to find a juicy story. And she ends up getting it because she ends up being committed. And that basically gets through us, <laughs> gets us through to this where I'm at right now watching this because she was just committed. And that bitch actually signed her in, <laughs> signed her in like as a witness her girlfriend, that's cold. That is so cold, man. I mean, I get it. Like, And that's a great scene with uh, Sister Jude going into the girlfriend's house and saying, like, I can just expose this whole love nest between you guys and have a scandal and she'll be committed anyway. Or we can do it discreetly and you can just sign this and, you know, <laughs> we'll forgive you. You're like, you could, <laughs> you could still teach and shit. Nobody will know you're a lesbian. And then she's like, she does it. Like, she says no at first, but then, like, she's really, like, hammering it on her sister, Jude. She's like, you know, you'll be destroyed. You'll never enter a classroom again. Like, well, and self-preservation, man. I mean, it kicks in for her. And she signs, this, and she signs her lover into a mental institution to cure her of being gay. That is terrifying. <laughs> I have mentioned before... I think it was in, when I was talking about Grave Encounters, like, early in my channel, in my video for that, that my, it plays on some of my biggest fears. And those fears are being lost because it's, at the least, fucking frustrating and, at the most, could be terrifying, depending where you're lost. Losing touch with reality and being kept somewhere against my will. And that's exactly what happens to her here. Like being committed into an asylum against your will has got to be one of the most terrifying fucking things in the world. I, I mean, It's such a big fear of mine. I don't know why, but oh, like, can you imagine? You go into this place as a free person, as a sane person, as this journalist, the only... And it's, and it's not even a crime, but like in, in the eyes of the church that runs this asylum and, you know, the, the asylum itself, it's a crime that she's gay. And that's, that's enough to just commit her. And now you're stuck in a mental institution under abysmal conditions with actual insane people. <laughs> You're all right. These people are fucked up all around you all the time. You're chained and, like, strapped down to your bed. You're getting tranked every fucking night with Thorazine. And, like, oh, man, it's got to be so terrible going through what this woman's gone through. And maybe that's why this season works the best for me. Because it, it actually does get to me a little bit because of these things that it plays on. Because of it playing on these certain... Ideas that are linked to fears of mine might be why this season works the best for me. But what an awesome scene. Great scene. And who is Adam Levine from, um, oh, why can't I think of their name? Because I don't listen to that shitty music. Uh, Maroon 5. I don't listen to pop music on the radio. I don't think I've listened to the radio in like 15 years. I, I just don't. I can't. Unless it's like WBAB, classic rock, or like something like that. What it has nothing to do with anything. But Adam Levine, in the beginning of, of the first episode, he's with this uh, his girlfriend in the show. And they go to Briarcliff, the asylum here. And there's the whole tale of Bloody Face, which is cool, too. I mean, it's a stupid fucking name. But <laughs> it's, it's all right. Like, it's not like a completely out there inclusion like the whole alien stuff with grace later on but they're like in the, they're hanging out like in modern day and bloody face is supposed to be in there and like the girlfriend and him are getting all crazy and can you imagine being like 
<laughs> Can you imagine being just like this unknown actress? Like, I mean, she's unknown to me, but being this woman, just an actress, and being able to play like a fuck scene with Adam Levine from Maroon Five, like <laughs> that's got to be unreal, right? Like, it's like if, it's like if I got to be in a movie and like with like young Farrah Fawcett. Like and have a sex scene, like it's like who am I? It's like that. That must be insane. Like thought of it earlier. Thought I'd mention it now. And then he gets his fucking arm ripped off because this just bitch is so pushy. Like she's really like keeps saying, "Put your phone through the and look through the slot and stuff." Like do it again, I'll blow you. And like <laughs> this girl is so funny at the beginning of this fucking uh, whole season. And let it also be known here that I'm just blanket this that. Lang in this season, and just as an actress in general, is so underrated. She's so underrated. Like, I remember her from um, seeing her when I was young in uh, the King Kong remake, uh, the Dino De Laurentiis one from the, the late 70s, and in uh, Cape Fear from 91. She's always been such a great actress and so underrated. And I was so glad when this show came out that she was in this for the first five seasons and that, like, this was, like, rejuvenated her career because she deserves it, because she kills it, especially in this role. And it's a shame that we never got James Cromwell back after this season because he absolutely kills it, too, as Dr. Harden. The, the best characters in this whole show, for me, are in this season. And no, I probably won't, I definitely will not be doing this for all the seasons, like, anytime soon. This is just a spur-of-the-moment type thing. I just woke up, so uh, I resubscribed to Hulu for some reason, because I haven't had it for months, and I saw American Horror Story pop up. Actually, I saw American Horror Stories pop up, and I didn't even know that was a thing until, like, a month, month and a half ago, and Nanette uh, told me. And... I was like, oh, I should check that out. So I might check that out. Maybe I'll do something on that. But this was just random. Saw American Horror Story and said, oh, hey, maybe I can binge most of this <laughs> like throughout the night here doing nothing. So probably won't be doing this for any of the other seasons for a while. Like, I still got, I forgot that I even started uh, the Goosebumps series and stuff. I still got to do uh, more of those soon. And Lana Winters. I don't, know, I don't know how I blanked on that fucking name that Sarah Paulson plays. <laughs> it's the main character. It's uh, Lana, yes. And I, let's just let's talk about this too, way early. But the usage of Philip Glass's uh, It's Always Been You, Helen composition from Candyman in the last episode of this, mo of this season. Brilliant so excellently used and those of you who listen enough you guys know I absolutely adore the score to Candyman I've done covers of it I love that piece and when I heard it in, in the end of the season I, I was giddy like hearing it it was used so well and again yes the girlfriend here we're in episode 3 now by the way <laughs> she she feels terrible yeah and she's saying, like, I, I, I got to recant. And, like, she t tells her two friends and everything. And they understand if she'd recant or if she didn't. And, like, so she, of course, she feels terrible of doing this to Lana. But she still fucking did it. <laughs> like, it, it's, you know what I mean? That's like robbing a bank and then saying, like, yeah, I feel bad. I shouldn't have done that. But, like, you still did it. You're still going to jail. You still broke the law. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so I, that never works for me. When people do some fucked up shit, I then think about it and feel bad and then say, like, oh, I should take it back or I should do the right thing. Well, you should have done the right thing in the first place and not sign that fucking document. Stick by your lover. Come on, woman, really? I then bloody face comes and just kills her. The I, I really, now that thinking about it, the whole bloody face thing is just kind of st stupid. <laughs> like, it is. It doesn't really work for me. But... Again, it's not, not like out there, out there, like the alien stuff, but it's just, it's still out there. And it, yeah, it ties into the story, but I, I just don't care for it. That's, it. that's another thing in this season that doesn't work for me. And the music to the this whole show, like the opening theme music, is so great. Like, such, like, 
just the weird sound usage to create the beats and the music and it it, it works so well for this show and it, it sounds like a real horrific theme like it's great all right well let's like lose some viewers 15 minutes and that's fine because because <laughs> just seeing the title card with uh adam and brad felchick and adam uh what the hell's his name why can't i think of it whatever uh, uh murphy the creators I think they're excellent writers. I think they're excellent creators and you know, idea people. They've come up with a lot of great ideas for shows and you know American Crime Story with the OJ case and like they know what they're doing when it comes to making new projects. I think later in this series, why it starts losing me a bit is just I can't stand all the political agenda that they push in the show. It, it's so over-the-top liberal, in-your-face bullshit. And I'm, I'm not a liberal. I'm not, I don't talk politics at all on the show. But quickly, right? I'm not either or. But it's just either or of those being pushed into your face is annoying as shit. And later on in this, se in this uh, series, not the season... You used to see more and more of that, especially with when Cult came out. And then going forward, it's just in your face and, it, and the gay, too, so much gay stuff. I understand that one of them's gay or both, or I don't know. And like, trans stuff and all, all this woke liberal shit. It's fine, whatever. But I don't like it just so heavily forced into my fucking throat. And that's what it does later in uh, as this series goes on. I keep wanting to say, I keep saying season, but series, I want to say. It's tolerable here because there's nothing in your face about it. But as it went from cult onwards, it, it gets so heavy handed. And I, it's probably why I stopped watching. Like, I, st I haven't seen the last few seasons. I stopped watching after the Slasher one. And that one wasn't that good either. Or the one right after that with the two stories together. And I can't even remember that season. But figured I'd get that out of the way because we're not going to be talking about the rest of the seasons after this. So just keeping it contained to Asylum. And God damn, and the dynamic between Lang and Paulson is absolutely fantastic in everything, but in, in, in this whole show, but in this season particularly, so good. Same with Cromwell and uh, Lang, same with Lily Rabe and Jessica Lang, same with Rabe and Paulson, like and, um, Evan Peters and the girl who plays Grace that we never saw again. <laughs> I don't know who she is, the actress's name, but she's cute, well, cute as hell, that girl. But their chemistry, everyone plays and gels together so brilliantly in this season. And this is why this is so terrifying, <laughs> the whole concept of this. She, Sister Jude, is fucking vicious in this, and I love it. Just, she is so vicious towards Lana. That she ends up saying, like, that, oh, uh, Lana's like, oh, I have a very good memory. I don't need, uh, you know, to, to write anything down. And she says, we'll see about that. And she goes to Dr. Arden. And she says, you know, coming around to this therapy of yours. <laughs> Shocking the shit out of people with ECT. Coming around to it. It's just another tool in God's <laughs> tool chest. So, and then they bring Lana in. And there's nothing she can say to stop it. She's now a fucking patient there, and she's screaming out, like, this woman's a kidnapper, like, I don't belong here, like, like she blackmailed my lover into, into signing me into here, I'm, I don't belong here, and you can scream that all you want, and there's nothing that you can do, that they're still gonna just fucking shock the hell out of you, <laughs> like, that is so scary, that, to be that helpless, oh, I can't imagine, man, and, and it's portrayed so well here. A little nostalgic thing here. And another brilliant thing. The usage of the uh, Singing Nun song, La Dominique, throughout this season. Such a fucking fantastic decision. <laughs> it is used to such great effect. It makes you feel like you're in there going insane with these people. Like, it's used so well, man. I love it. And... 
when or a little bit after this came out. I mean, what what year this came out? Two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve ish. Yeah, my daughter was born of two thousand fourteen. So maybe like a few years after this came out, or maybe a rewatch or something. And my daughter was very young, and she heard the song. And then me, my father, <laughs> my mother, we would all play this for her. And she would just start laughing, and she would just get in the, the greatest of moods. And she doesn't remember it now. She's like nine now. But when she was young, it was, we used to play that for her all the time. So every time I hear it now, I think of my daughter here. But the way that they use it is so well done in this whole entire season. And Lily Rabe and, and Cromwell together are great. And this whole scene here with the the apples that she's like she's like feeding these experiments <laughs> that Arden's been doing on people, like just making these people into just twisted, weird creatures. <laughs> and we get to see that awesome scene like later on in uh, one of the episodes with Chloe Savigny, which I loved her since I first saw her in. Um, kids <laughs> from 95 what a fucked up movie that is from uh oh what the hell is his name i always forget the director's name of kids because it's such a weird name not the director larry clark um uh harmony kareen the the writer it's such a crazy movie kids <laughs> i gotta rewatch that maybe i'll do a video on that that's a fucked up movie man that movie's sticks with you like i think i've only seen it once or twice but that movie sticks with you when you see it nothing to do with american horror story doesn't matter but that scene that we get to see with savigny when she's all mangled and fucked up and amputated and stuff that's great zachary kinto as uh threadson another great performance perfect perfect casting for for this character and this is why fucking relig church and shit, religions should not be running medical facilities of any kind. They shouldn't be running anything, in my opinion. But that's me. They do not mix. This is a fucking mental hospital. And I know this happened a lot back in the day. And this, I, don't, I don't know if this is still a thing today. Maybe in other countries. I don't know in America. I can't think of a mental institution that a church is the head of. I, I don't know. I've never been to a mental institution. <laughs> I'm not an expert. But just even worse here, because then you have to deal with just religious ideologies that either you believe in or you don't and are complete bullshit to you or not. And that's what's backing up medical decisions and stuff to take care of patients. And that is scary as hell. That is so scary that people are just submitted to the will of others and their beliefs and what they'll do or not do to help people. And most of the time, it does not help. It hurts. And God damn, does everybody in this asylum, man, is so fucked up. Like, no one is getting help. Nobody is getting better. It's just a dumping ground. And that's exactly what asylums were, like, decades ago. For, and for a long time since the asylums were a thing, they were just dumping grounds for family members and stuff that were just considered embarrassments or just were mentally ill and didn't know how to fix them. And they would just dump them there. They wouldn't get any help. They'd never get better. And most often they'd just die there. And it's, it, it's tragic. It really is. Unless you have a patient who's possessed like Jed here, then, yeah, call a priest and shit. Get some religion in here. <laughs> like, immediately. But, but aside from that, <laughs> everything I said stands. But, yeah, you get you get actual demonic possession, bring in the priests. You know, bring the nuns, bring everybody. Bring the religious troops. The power of Christ compels you. And we got an ad, so let's go to Meatwad, as usual, with the weather. Meatwad, what's the weather like here in New York? Sometimes the weather will be like 62 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a little bit cloudy, but the moon outside, it's still it's nice about 3.30 in the morning. 
Well, I know the time. I'm looking right at it, and it is definitely a nice moon out there. What are you doing tonight? I'm just hanging out. I'm just hanging out with Home Banana. He's my dog, and I love my home dog. It's not his home banana. It's such a good dog. Yeah, I know. You've mentioned him many times. All right. Thank you so much, me. Well, I'll talk to you soon. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Remember when I mentioned uh, Grace? It was sexy as shit earlier. Yeah, her little shower scene. Oh, she's sexy as shit. Well, damn, I should. Hey, get out of here. And Grace is an interesting character. Yeah. Besides how she looks. <laughs> she with the whole, that she killed her, her family, right? Her parents, if I recall correctly. Well, I guess that's been a while since I've seen this whole season. But she's a murderer. And her relationship with Kid is awesome. And he's not a murderer. If I'm recalling correctly, he didn't actually do the crimes, right? He's innocent. Yeah. And he's being analyzed by threats and stuff, whether he stays here or not. So Lana and Grace are talking about escaping. And Lana says that the tunnel that she came in through and that she can get out that way. And she says that kid has to come. And she says, no, that he's a murderer. And then later on, she like learns and realizes that she's wrong, that he was innocent. And awesome at the end of this like, when um what's her name the uh his wife kit's wife the black chick when she uh axes um grace in the neck <laughs> dude that is such a great scene when that when i first saw that episode i had no idea that that was coming like that was that was really shocking and that was good and savigny kills it in this role that small role that she has here as a little horny slut. Things have not changed since kids for her. <laughs> That's another thing with asylums and stuff. You know that people are getting raped all the time. Like patients raping other patients. Or just consensual sex <laughs> between patients. And people, patients getting raped by people who work there. Like, which is another just terrifying thing about being in this in environment in any way, shape, or form. Oh, I don't like asylums, if you haven't been able to tell. Love it. Makes you sound insane, or feel insane. And can you imagine having to listen to the same record over and over and over and over and over and over? I would fucking lose my mind. If I, if I was normal as can be, I would lose my goddamn mind. Like being sane. Like, let alone being an insane person, <laughs> having to hear this shit all the time. Are you serious? They probably wouldn't even notice after a while. On oh, Pepper, my little pinheaded, lovable freak. The possession scene is really cool. When they're trying to get the demon out of this guy. Which, again, feels kind of shoehorned in here. I mean, I, I know you gotta have stuff happening every episode, but that's one criticism I can give towards this whole show. This whole series is that it tries fitting way too much stuff into every season. It tries too many ideas thrown in, like, into a hodgepodge of just weird tangents, and they don't always work for me or for others, and sometimes they work for some people and they don't for others. But I noticed that from the very first season, from the very first, uh, yeah, season, that would murder house they with the zombies and stuff that like come out of nowhere and shit like or is that in a uh, coven something like that but it's it's it, it's often in the series that we see this that we see just a random thing thrown in just another cool idea it may be but it just feels forced and this one doesn't feel that forced, but it's still kind of out there. It's like, all right, so <laughs> this whole story is about this woman who's getting com who's committed against her will to this asylum, and now there's just a random possession from a demon, and then we're never going to hear about it again. So it, it it feels forced a bit, even though I know like the sister, uh, your Ariunas, however the hell you say her name, gets possessed and says this. this doesn't she say that she's the devil, though? Like, so, like... I don't know. Now I gotta think about this. And remember, while I'm watching this, that, um... If she gets possessed by the person that... 
the demon that's possessing this kid right now. If so, then everything I just said, forget about. <laughs> because then it, it, it kicks off that whole thing. But, like, I remember her saying that she was, like, the devil. Like, when she's possessed. So I don't remember it being, like, the same demon that possesses this kid. But maybe it is. I don't remember. So it shouldn't have spoke so soon. But who, who gives a fuck? Man, that scene, and then when uh, the father, when, um, like, the old guy performing the exorcism, when he gets flung into the wall, <laughs> they got to take him to an infirmary, infirmary, <laughs> and the father goes and has Sister Jude. Now he needs her services. Says, like, can you watch after the possessed dude? Like, we got to go check on the guy. And she walks in there, falling for the stupid trick from the demon saying whatever oh my eyes hurt and shit and then what he starts saying her man <laughs> that's some brute that's some fucked up stuff he's saying that like you know how's it feel to be the smartest person in the room but like no one have no power because of the smelly clam between your legs and like you were like the town pump and you've had like take me in your mouth you've had 53 already like you've sucked 53 cocks already <laughs> Dude, that's some crazy shit. 53 cocks. <laughs> Amateurs. And I love Lana, but fuck Lana here. For screaming out and saying, oh, when Kitten, when Kitten Grace are saying, we'll find her own way out, she screams out, sabotages the whole thing, and then they come, oh, the murderer is getting away. Like, fuck you, bitch. Are you serious? Like, you have to take them down with you? Yeah, remember all that shit I was saying about the possession stuff earlier? Yeah, forget all that, because, yeah, that's how Arianus gets possessed. So, it's not forced. It's, it's part of it. <laughs> I forgot. Your mossy bank is uh, what Cromwell and Dr. Arden uh, refers to a pussy as. The whole character of Arden, I mean, aside from being just brilliantly played by Cromwell, is such a complex character, man. Like... He's this fucking Nazi scientist doctor who's fucking taken by the Americans after the war. And he's doing these experiments. He's sexually repressed in a lot of ways. He, he has call girls and shit come over and, like, other sisters. And he has pictures of them. But, like, he doesn't like overly sexual girls. Like, he likes them pure. And then his whole relationship awkwardly with the Ariunas. It's what a great character, man. Like, it's a shame that I think... Didn't Cromwell come back for, like, an appearance in a later season? Like, a later, later one? Maybe I'm misremembering that, but... They should have had him in the show a lot more because God, he's good. But thank God we got um, Dennis O'Hare after this because God, Dennis O'Hare kills it and everything in this whole show. And the whole nickname Jude gives her Lana Banana is awesome, and the whole the musical numbers in the show do nothing for me. They really don't. I'm not a musical person. Like, I'm a huge music guy, but I don't like musicals. And they just bust into random songs. Like, it's it's very minimal in the early seasons, but it happened more often later on. Freak Show had a few, but they do absolutely nothing for me. But the, the Lana Banana song in this, I mean, it is catchy. It, it's a cool scene. Like, <laughs> so I can't harp on that one. But later on, like, some of the music scenes just... Oh, real, uh, you know, noble of Kit to uh, take 40 lashes for Grace to not take any, but my whole question is, who the fuck has time to lash someone, smack them on the ass 40 times, man? Like, come on. I'd give them two, three shots, get the fuck out of my office. Like, this woman really has time to whip him 40 times? Like, why not throw another 60, make it 100, sit there for a three-hour tea party. Like, come on. <laughs> How stupid that is. Yeah, I wasn't fully paying attention, but, like, because the credits started playing for the episode. But all I saw was, like, the character names. And there was one called The Mexican. I don't know who that is, but it seems real on the nose and racist. Except it's not, because if he's Mexican, then he's the fucking Mexican, I guess. Episode 3, Nor'easter. 
this bitch is still alive and shit with bloody face. Like, wrap it up. And it finally does. She stabs the shit out of him after he's about to get a... What's your call it? Adam Levine is still alive. His arm's been ripped off, but he's still able to get up and push uh, Bloody Face out of the way from killing the girl. And then she ends up stabbing him. And then there's a bunch of Bloody Face. It's, it's I hate all this. Like it, it, it keeps getting worse. Like as I'm rewatching this, I don't like this whole wraparound start of every episode with the Bloody Face shit. Because now like they're just some like stupid kids and one guy's dead. Like. <laughs> Nothing to do with the main story. I mean, it it does very little, but it does nothing for me. Just stop with all this now. And then the real bloody face comes. Kills the other two dumbasses. Season has the best opening sequence also. Like, for me, absolutely. Freak Show is good, too. I really like Freak Show's uh, opening. But this one's still the best for me. The whole backstory of Sister Jude is interesting, too. If I recall correctly, because she saw like someone sent to the newspaper or something, that she had a hit and run, right? She hit some girl and killed her, or that she thought she did. And then in, near the end of the season, she finds out that you know, the person's still alive. Something like that. But like that whole guilt that's been on her for all these years explains a lot about the way that she is. And as, as I said, she has like a promiscuous past. So like she was the town whore. Like so, it, you could see it, it's great character development for her. I love her whole character, Sister Jude, in this season. It did such a great performance, such a great character, such a great backstory. Just great development of her throughout the whole season. And she's so nice because there's going to be a nor'easter. It's a big ass storm coming this tonight as she was so kind that she was on the phone all morning getting the projector so they can watch Exorcist 3 wait no it's the sign of the cross <laughs> that the Archdiocese has lent them a copy of how nice of her to distract them during the storm such a saint sister Jude you are and I know at the very beginning of this I already praised everybody in this this whole show but Lily Rabe's performance is the Almost the standout in this whole sh season, rivaling Jessica Lang's absolutely mesmerizing performance. The way that she goes from so timid and everything to getting possessed and just acting just totally different. And what a phenomenal performance, man. I love Lily Rabe in everything I've seen her in, but she absolutely destroyed this role. And then this is when we start seeing some of the alien bullshit. And I've said, <laughs> I feel like I don't like aliens as much as I always say and think I do. Because I, I believe in aliens. I love watching documentaries and videos on aliens and shit. You would think a lot more of that stuff in movies, and horror movies especially, would work for me. But they don't. <laughs> It just this is a absolutely shoehorned in here, but we see Kit getting on Doctor Arden's table and showing him in the jar the little implant bug, whatever it is that's trying to get back into Kit that he took out last time, and just this whole introduction of the aliens is is so out there. It doesn't belong. It should have never been put in this season. Here we go. One of my favorite scenes in this whole season when the Sister Uriunus goes into the cell or the room of the uh, mental patient, the woman, the Spanish woman, who's like knows that she's the devil, <laughs> that she's possessed at least, or thinks that she is the devil itself, himself, and starts freaking out. And then she, she just proceeds to pray with her and forces her to pray. And she's fucking terrified. And then she just takes scissors or something. And she stabs her in the neck and pulls a pulls it back out and the blood splurts all over the bed and then she stabs her again in the chest it looks fantastic it looks so good the effects are great love that scene and again her performance is just mind-blowing Man, it really works so well. 
I would have killed myself so long ago, though, if I was one of these patients. Help me, Dr. Oliver Threatson. You're my only hope. Yo, Chloe, I love you, Chloe Savigny, but don't you dare yell at my girl Peppa, you bitch. Great scene when the storm with the lightning coming through the room with Sister Jude, and she gets the phone call uh, from, I'm guessing it's Sister Ariunas, you know, the demon inside her and stuff, doing the voice, but she gets the call from the girl that she hit years ago and saying that you just left me there and you never get out of the car and she starts like hysterically crying and losing it man and then the glasses are there the broken glasses from the kid and then she reaches out to the communion wine she hasn't touched in a drink since like 49 or some shit great scene so yeah she gets fucking sauced on wine <laughs> and then heads in to start the movie and stuff and then and yeah the the bitch's name is the mexican <laughs> the mexican woman who got killed by uh Arianus. the guy the guard just said like the mexican's not in the room like i'll check again <laughs> so that that really is her name in the show i guess which this is what just just about a decade ago or so and fine, you can have a character called the Mexican. You have you would not have that in the show today, because people would fucking flip their lid and go ape shit over it and say, "Oh, the Mexican, that's racist and shit." And you, oh, I hate the world today. Every movie, show, anything horror related that takes place in an asylum, there's always a patient that's coddling a doll like it's their baby that they killed. Every single one. And it's showtime, and they start watching this movie. And we get the whole discussion between Threadson and um, Lana that are about her girlfriend and that he went to go visit her and that he found blood. And it's just like some of the other victims of Bloody Face, which we know is Threadson in the end. And then his son is the one at the beginning of the episodes, and that waste of time that those are. <laughs> I'm sorry, those should have just not been there. Forget the whole present day shit. Keep it here in this time period. So the Great Escape, take two, has begun. And Lana joins Grace and Chloe Savigny. And I don't know her fucking character. Shelly, is that it? Yeah, maybe it's Shelly. And Kit start escaping. And Shelly ends up just sucking a dick for the team. And... <laughs> The other three end up going through the door, and she stays behind to suck off one of the guards. This whole sequence is great, though. This whole episode, in fact, because it, it, ev everything starts, everybody starts degrading mentally in this. Like, we have Sister Jude wandering the halls, drunk, seeing things. We have uh, Dr. Arden, who's uh messing with the statue <laughs> and putting lipstick on it and drawing tits on it and calling it a whore and it, the the storm with the lightning and the thunder and, and then Shelly sucking off the dude like all of it is is it's disorienting it feels very disorienting it's very well done <laughs> and Arden goes to rape Shelly, and she starts laughing at his dick and saying, like, like, what happened? You have an accident or some shit? So I don't know what happened to him, but he's got a baby dick, apparently, or something very bad happened to him. All right, all of this is so fucking stupid. When they leave, they get out the tunnel. They get to freedom. And just the whole thing with the, these experimented on patients, these creatures and shit, living in the woods and stuff right around the asylum is so dumb. That should not even be here. It is so stupid that what the... Every single one of these things is so loyal. It stays around, what, for food? None of these things have wandered off. None of them have wandered into town. Nobody who's come to the asylum for any reason has ever seen any of these things. There seems to be a decent amount of them. Like, all of that is so fucking stupid. I don't like any of it. And, and it ruins their escape. They, they run back into the asylum. I would be... I'd risk death. I would... What difference does it make which direction you run away from the creatures run away from the asylum and just keep on running like and they run back into the place it, it's that whole sequence is so oh, i do not like that that is so stupid and then she, when shelly wakes up 
on uh, Dr. Arden's table, and he said that you were naughty, you had to run away, you tried running away, and I had to clip your wings, and then he pulls the sheet off, and both their legs were being amputated. Oh, can you imagine just waking up and your legs are gone? Dude, fuck that. <laughs> that is so terrible. Episode 4, Anne Frank, Part 1. And I am not for this whole idea either. This whole thing with Anne Frank, with this patient, who supposedly the Anne Frank, like, it's so random. It has nothing to do with anything. This is, even the best season of the show has a few examples of this, as I've mentioned some in the past. It just doesn't work. It's just another idea thrown in there that just, why, for what? Like, we get it, she's from Germany, Sister Jude, and she knows her, she should know her, or something, it, 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 just, it doesn't matter, <laughs> like, it seems so out of left field, same with the alien stuff, it should be wiped right out. Oh, and not, uh, Sister Jude, uh, Dr. Arden, from being in, in Nazi Germany, and she knows, he knows, uh, and Frank knows him and recognizes him. He said you have a Nazi working here. All of this doesn't work. It's it's just, uh, I don't know. They dropped the ball in the middle of the season. And Hans Gruber is Arden's real name. Like, come on, man. Nice little diehard reference. Like, come on. The... Was this a Halloween episode, this and the next one? Because it's usually a two-parter for Halloween. I feel like this show always, for the most part, drops the ball on the Halloween episodes. Same with Free Show. With uh, whoever the hell his name was. With the uh, face on the back of his head. who com- Edward Mordrake, who comes back every, now, every Halloween if people perform, if the freaks perform. All of that is bullshit is stupid too like it's, they do this with a lot of their two parters that just they're just random ideas just hodgepodge in here and they don't it didn't need it you know, like 12 episodes this season is i think 12 13 could have cut it down to 10 get rid of the alien shit get rid of the stuff with, with Anne frank <laughs> especially here and a few other things and you would perfect 10 episodes you ever hear a Jewish firework? It's the ones that go... <laughs> now, as much as I adore Evan Peters, as I said, and he does a great job, this kitten here, he's very underutilized in this season. And I get it. It was the second season. I mean, he doesn't play a big part in the first season either. He really grew into becoming a major player in this show. I'd say probably around Freak Show, Hotel especially, but God, he's so great in this, but he really is, he could, they could have given him more material. I feel like if they given him a little more stuff to work with, this could have been even better, because he could have done anything. And then Kit and Grace have a nice little fucking brace, and then... That leads to her becoming pregnant with their their alien children <laughs> later on. Uh, then Sister Jude says that they're going to sterilize the two of them, Kit and uh, Grace. Yo, I would be punching motherfuckers left and right. I'd be punching Sister Jude. I'd be knocking her out a window. I'd be kicking Sister Devil Eunice in the fucking tits in the face. She'd go flying down the stairs. I'd take the guard. Yo, I would go insane. You kidding me? Fight for your life before they touch your balls or clit. Are you serious? Like, do that. Make sure. If you're ever in this situation, <laughs> if you're ever in a mental institution, and they try to do this to you and sterilize you, take my advice just now. That's what you do. And the whole scene of, like, the therapy with Dr. Thredson, with Lana having to, like, grab the guy's dick, and, like, while she's touching herself in front of Dr. Thredson, and that, like, relate the pleasure to try to convert her, like, to being straight. What a disturbing scene, man. Like, that's a very well done, that whole scene. And we get the nice little reveal that the father... I, I can't think of the actor's name, man, but he, he's great in this. Who plays the name? Uh, it's Father. No, Father Thomas is uh, of the Living Dead, Fulci. Um, father something. But the younger guy. Awesome actor. And he has the whole scene with Sister Jude and 
pretty much like make her fear for her job. I'm saying that she's like drunk, she's drinking again. Maybe the job is too much for her and everything like that. And then he ends up calling Dr. Harden and we find out that he knows about everything about him. And he's saying that they're off to you, you have house cleaning to do, do it now. And he's still working on uh, Chloe Savigny. <laughs> she's still busy, she's you know, obviously she's still missing her legs. But she, her legs are like kicking around and her, her stumps. <laughs> cool effects work. And she's still messing around with her. Man, she must be just in so much pain and suffering, and she, and I, I'm pretty sure, doesn't someone find her, and then she says, um, she just says, like, kill me, like, like, I, I do not blame her. Storm, it's up to you to make clear that path again. I like the scene when Grace is explaining, uh, finally, like, who knows if it is even the truth, because she's a fucking murderer, so you can't take a, take a single word she says is truth. But she says that she killed her, uh, father and her stepmother, because her father used to molest her and rape her and stuff like that when she was, since she was a young kid. And when she told her stepmother, she would just keep quiet, just give her candy and keep her quiet that way and she just snapped and killed him so it was a crime of passion and fucking deservedly so <laughs> like for the father fucking fuck that if that's what he was really doing but again who knows if she's telling the truth i like to think she is but who knows again because she's a murderer and then could you imagine having this hope that uh, Threadson says to Lana and says that I'm getting you out of here by the end of the week, like, and when I leave, like, no matter what, you're coming with me, and, like, you could see just how happy and believe she is. Can you imagine hearing those words and, like, counting on that, and then it just not happening? Like, imagine that? Like, oh, that's gotta be the worst thing in the world. It's gotta be, like, in prison, where if, like, you go up for parole, and they're, everyone's saying, you got this, yeah, it's a sure thing, and then, like, you go out, and then you get denied, and it's like, oh, that's gotta be, like, just the worst feeling ever. We've all had that feeling before. Maybe not on that grand scale, but of having hope for something, and then having it just yanked the fuck away from you, like, right at the, the end there. Oh, it's terrible feeling. You don't get a lot of great scenes early on in the season between Kit and Sister Jude, but God, man, Evan Peters with Jessica Lang together going off each other is just brilliant. And then we have Anne Frank, if that is her real name, <laughs> with Dr. Uh, Arden and shoots him in the leg and then says that she's not the only one on to him and she got to grab the gun from the cop, which... <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure I, it could happen. When he was walking, walking past the cop, she just grabs his gun out. He didn't feel that. All right, whatever. And then she opens the uh, closet or whatever, and uh, Shelly, Chloe Savigny's in there, and the boils all over her face with the no legs. Awesome. <laughs> like, such a cool uh, little shot there of her. She looks fucked up. <laughs> And that's how the episode ends, man. So, I don't know. I'll probably end this here. And it's, well, this is four episodes. I'm pretty sure there's 12, 13 tops episodes in this season. So I'll probably just do two more of these. Either later or whenever I get the time to sit through a few more of them. But this was fun, going through American Horror Story a little. I haven't watched the show in a in years, a few years for sure, so definitely fun, and uh, definitely some stuff I did not remember, but still holds up for me so far, like, for this watch, as it usually does, it is mostly fantastic, so, alright guys, another episode of the Horror After Dark Podcast, in the sack with JT, alright, it was nice, we, we cuddled, we fucked, it was great, and we'll never talk about this again. Thank you.